So, welcome to the final lecture of this particular series. Now, uh, we are going to study bubble detachment today. So, if you take a look at the slide, you will find that a bubble as we say it first it first it forms those nice hemispherical caps and then it slowly grows and at one point of time it detaches right. So, bubble size at departure is dominated by a balance between buoyancy and the liquid inertial forces particularly when the cavity size is small ok. If the cavity size is large then the bubble growth is slow and inertia is unimportant then the force balance between buoyancy and surface tension is what determines the, bu the bubble size at departure. So, for example, Fritz et al found that the bubble size as departure is given by this particular relationship where this theta is basically nothing but this contact angle. Now, for water okay, uh, and for other fluids okay, Cole and Renshaw found that the, the droplet size at the point of departure is also a function of the the Jacob number, but this is a different definition of Jacob number as you can see, but its essence is the same this is the like the sensible enthalpy divided by the uh, by the latent heat. So, it is also dependent on the Jacob number as well. So, this was like two different studies, but uh, mo both the studies actually show that the bubble size at departure is usually buoyancy inertia dominated or buoyancy surface tension dominated depending on the size and a multitude of other factors ok. Now, if we look at now this particular diagram over here ok you will find that there are many forces which are acting on a bubble at the point of departure right. So, these forces are basically F D, F S, F I, F P and F B. So, basically F D is the drag force F S is basically the force due to surface tension, F I is the inertial related force, F P is the pressure force and F B is the buoyancy related force ok. Now, the bubble would actually departure depart if one of these forces I mean the sum total of these forces somehow becomes imbalanced. So, let us go back to our little journal uh, item over here and there we will show that from the forces that are acting on the bubble F D plus F S is equal to F I plus F P plus F B right ok. So, F S is very straightforward is 2 pi R B into sigma into sin theta right where theta we know is a contact angle R B is equal to the base radius. This we already saw from that little figure that we had over here. So, this is your basically your R B ok. So, you should consult the two nodes. So, as the bubble grows the drag force will act on the bubble right. If the bubble is spherical and translates with a velocity of dr by dt. So, this is equivalent to saying that this is a bubble which is translating at a velocity dr by dt. There will be an equivalent drag force that will be created on the bubble ok. So, that drag force is given by F D and that is the drag force that we uh, say is actually what is acting on the bubble which is anchored onto the substrate right. So, this drag force is given by C D rho L by 2 d r by d t square pi r square where C D is basically equal to 45 by R E. R E is basically given by 2 rho L by mu L R into d R by d t ok. Now, for a spherical bubble submerged in a stagnant fluid the buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced right. Buoyancy force Archimedes principle is equal to the weight of fluid displaced right. So, that F B is therefore, given as 4 pi r cube by 3 rho L minus rho V into G. Now, in most of the cases the vapor inertia is negligible right, the inertia of the vapor phase within the bubble is negligible, but the inertia of the liquid surrounding the bubble is not negligible ok. So, what Hans and Griffith found Griffith found 
is that the affected liquid mass is 11 by 16th that is a strange number of the bubble volume. Okay. So, your F i basically is given as 11 by 6 pi r cube rho l d t square. Okay. Now, F p which is the pressure force is basically nothing but see if you understand it 2 sigma by r plus p v into pi r b square okay, where p v minus p l is equal to 2 sigma by r. So, it is basically the excess vapor pressure and capillary pressure that is what it is. Okay. So, the, bub the departure radius departure radius or the radius at which the bubble departs is when, when the total force force okay, changes sign from positive to negative. Okay. So, when the total force changes time uh, changes sign from positive to negative. Okay. So, if you look at it you will find that okay, uh, these are the distribution of the forces basically. Say for example, forces acting this is 1 g acceleration, this is 0.29 g acceleration. So, when the bubble is accelerating, so, so these are the forces as you can see couple of observations the buoyancy moves up like that. Okay. Uh, the inertia is more or less unaffected, it does not change no matter what acceleration you are bringing to the table. Okay. So, the buoyancy is directly related basically to the gravitational acceleration. So, these are the forces profiles that you see for the bubble at the point of departure. Okay. Okay. So, the, uh, so, this is what is uh, with respect to bubble detachment. right? So, these are the forces, these are the nature of the forces, the force changes is sign okay, and when it does that the, the bubble actually departs. Now, the bubble growth and merger okay, is another uh, significant topic that has been widely studied because how does the bubble grow, how does it merge. Okay. So, the main uh, work has been done by Son et al which is given here. Okay. Now, most of these things are solved by numerically, okay. there is no analytical solutions per se, but however, what Son et al I, I, I want to give you the spirit of what uh, the thing is in general okay, so that you have a, a good chance of attacking such problems in the future. So, basically what Son and et al did was that he divided the divided into two segments there is a macro region and then there is a micro region. Micro region is just that particular region. So, the macro region he solved it by the usual level set kind of a method. Okay. The micro region was solved by the lubrication theory micro region is really micro that means this this length scale is very small okay and you remember when the length scale is that small all your disjoining pressure and other things comes into the picture remember we talked about this long long time back okay so based on that particular argument okay what uh, we can do is that we can kind of uh, for the micro region because that is that this has to be solved numerically you cannot do anything about it. For the micro region we can give some uh, you know some equations which may be useful. Okay. So, conservation of mass this is only for the micro region the micro layer and we assume that it is a micro layer laminar flow. So, laminar flow is quite common. Okay. So, d delta by d t equal to v l q double prime rho l h l v. Okay. So, v l is the velocity which is normal to the interface, okay, normal to the film surface 
velocity normal to film surface ok. So, this V L from the regular continuity we can find it out to be like this 0 to delta R U L D Y right. So, you can see this that this is the change in the thickness of this layer ok which is given by the velocity and whatever is the heat this is heat divided by whatever is a latent heat. So, that is that m right. So, whatever is the mass that is being added to the whole thing ok. So, assume so in this case we are going to assume that conduction is the main mode of heat transfer in the across the thin film main heat transfer mode mode across the thin film ok. ok across the thin film ok. So, if that is the case so assume conduction also from uh, if we neglect inertia. So, we can write the lubrication equation basically. that is the lubrication equation right. If you recall that that is what the equation is all about ok. Let us see. So, we will uh, and so we will move to the journal once again ok. So, uh, in that particular case now that this is a different just to demarcate ok. So, uh, that is the lubrication theory. So, assuming conductive heat flux what you have is that you have T w minus T delta divided by delta. So, the T delta is the temperature at liquid vapor interface right ok is a vapor interface. Also you can write P l is equal to P v minus sigma k minus P d plus q double prime square divided by rho v h l v square. So, this is you know that this is the disjoining pressure which is given by this ok and k which is the curvature is actually given by r dr divided by 1 plus ok. So, Son basically did was that he solved all solved ok these equations to determine delta got it ok. So, what was the thing? So, you already had the delta equation you had the corresponding pressure equation which is the lubrication theory, then you had the heat transfer which is basically given by the conduction form and then you had the pressure ok and you have the curvature. So, all of these things combined you basically can find out you solve these equations to determine what is going to be its delta ok. In the macro region the entire thing was solved by the level set algorithm ok. So, th this was what Son actually did ok. Let us go back to our little powerpoint presentation ok over here. So, you can understand that how this region was basically. So, it is very simple this equation, this equation and the heat conduction equation ok and that is how this was basically solved ok. Again we are not going to show the solution it is a lengthy process ok it is still solved numerically you cannot solve it analytically, but these are the basic equations. So, you should get an idea of the basic equation that what is happening this is a continuity for example, this is the continuity if you look at the, this is the continuity equation, this is the momentum equation and that is the corresponding energy equation all right ok. So, three equations, but we are solving specific versions of the three equations ok ok. So, now uh, let us look at some of the correlations ok, because uh, we are more or less towards the end. 
So, the first correlation that we are going to look at in general the heat transfer and the heat flux, heat flux and the heat transfer coefficient during evaporation and nuclear boiling can be correlated with the driving temperature difference. So, for example, the, this is the most usual form that is Q double prime is equal to C 1 uh, into T w minus T sat raised to the power of m. Okay. But we also know that Q double prime is nothing but equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by T w minus T sat. So, one can get okay, you want if you substitute okay, you can get that your uh, H is given by this and H can be also written in terms of the heat flux right simple enough right. So, uh, so these are the so during evaporation and nuclear boiling. Now, if we compare so, there are a lot of constants as you can see C 1, C 2, C 3 etcetera, etcetera. Now, during evaporation and nuclear boiling, so there are two uh, paradigms over here. Now, let us look at nuclear boiling part, you will find that this m is of the order of 4. So, the heat flux is basically T w minus T sat raised to the power of 4, right. H is raised to the power of 3, that is 3. Okay, and this is H and uh, Q's relationship is uh, Q to the power of uh, 3 by 4. Whereas, in the case of laminar and turbulent flow whatever it is okay, this exponent is very small, much smaller right compared to nuclear boiling which is very normal like right? nuclear boiling is nuclear boiling. So, it is a lot it is a fundamentally a much aggressive mode of heat transfer right. So, the heat flux is quite a bit off okay. in the case of the evaporation this is only mildly above 1 right. It is just little above 1 okay. and the heat transfer coefficient is a lot it is like 1 fourth, but in these two cases you can see that they are quite high. Okay. So, this C 1, C 2, C 3 constants okay, also depend greatly upon the properties of the fluid and the heated surface materials and whatever is the geometry. So, this is a geometry dependent, property dependent, the, the material uh, uh, that means if you have a material which has got a lot of these kind of wedges right, okay, this C will be very different compared to a material which has got that kind of a texture. It also depends on the kind of fluid that you are actually dealing with. Okay. So, uh, this is for example, a typical temperature profile of nuclear boiling over our horizontal plate okay. and this is another profile uh, in, in fact, more than this, this particular profile is you would understand it better. So, heat transfer coefficient and heat flux have been plotted. So, you can clearly see that there is an evaporation regime and then there is this nuclear boiling regime. Right, and you can see that the power law profile is, is the same, though it does not share the same functional coefficients. Right. So, it is still power law that means, it is still T w minus T sat raised to the power of some m, right. but this value of m actually varies from here to here. Okay. Obviously, this being more aggressive m than that, this all looks almost linearish, okay. this looks like a lot higher coefficient than that. Okay. So, this has been plotted on the log log axis essentially. Okay. So, and for example, in this particular case it is raised to the power of 3. So, you can see what is the difference. Okay. So, evaporation is a lot milder process and boiling is a lot uh, uh, is a lot more aggressive process and these are that these are the correlations that we have given and these are the corresponding coefficients. Okay. So, that provides you with the capability of calculating that what is the heat flux and what is the heat transfer coefficient. Because in many cases you may not be interested in knowing all the bubble dynamics and all the other things, you may be just interested in knowing what is the heat transfer coefficient and what is the heat flux. So, that question we are able to answer here. The last discussion point is basically the critical heat flux. right? So, critical heat flux is as if you recall your boiling curve, in fact we have it over here somewhere. So, this is the boiling curve and as you know that the critical heat flux occurs at the end of the nuclear boiling spectrum. right? Okay. So, the critical heat flux if we recall, so the critical heat flux okay, uh, is what is referred to at the end of the nuclear boiling. So, this is the maximum heat flux that is obtainable by nuclear boiling. So, heat transfer in nuclear boiling basically involves what? it involves heat conduction from the liquid to the liquid vapor interface or evaporation at the liquid vapor interface, 
and escape of vapor from the heating interface. Okay. So, how is this critical heat flux reached? Okay. What is the mechanism? Now, if you recall earlier, what we said is that towards the end of the nucleate boiling, okay, these bubbles starts to merge with each other and form this vapor columns, like this is like columns of vapors that connects the surface that the heated surface with the liquid pool. Right. So, there are like columns of uh, vapor that actually forms. So, these columns of vapors are subjected to, to Helmholtz instability. Okay. They appear on the interface of this large vapor columns that are leaving the interface okay. and uh, people actually have done linear stability analysis on this. Okay. Remember linear stability analysis we did a little bit in atomizations, we did a little bit in Rayleigh Taylor and Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities also. Right. So, Linhard and Dhir, Vijay Dhir used the most dangerous wavelength in a two dimensional pattern for Taylor instability between formed between a horizontal semi infinite liquid and the corresponding vapor column. Okay. And that is given alpha d, alpha d is basically the wavelength. Okay. The diameter of each of this column is assumed to be half the dangerous wavelength. Okay. Now, for a vertical liquid and vapor flow, the critical Helmholtz velocity is given by this, it is basically the difference in the flux of the liquid and the vapor. Liquid and the vapor is the flux, it is a basically the flux difference between the two and that can be shown to be this, okay, where alpha is basically the wave number which is related to the wavelength by 2 pi by lambda d. Right. So, combining these two you get that the critical Helmholtz velocity is given by 2 pi sigma by rho v into lambda d. Lambda d is the most dangerous wavelength, it is also 2 times the diameter of each vapor column right, that forms at the end of this uh, nuclear boiling. Now, since the density of the vapor is significantly lower than the liquid, the upward vapor column velocity is much higher than the downward liquid column velocity understood because the vapor because of its low density it can move much faster right than the liquid which has got a much lower velocity. So, your u c is equal to u v which is given by this particular term. Now, this is interesting this is basically the ratio of the total surface area to the total surface area that is occupied by the vapor column. So, if you look at this particular diagram over here what I am drawing over here. So, these are say the pockets that are these are the vapor columns. Okay all these are vapors rest are liquid right. So, if this is the total area whatever this area is given by your A c right and the vapors actually occupy together combined they occupy this area A s. So, this is basically the total area ratio to the area ratio that is occupied by the vapor column it is actually the other way around I am sorry. So, Okay. So, it is basically uh, the total area to the area of the surface that is occupied by the vapor column. So, you can understand this is the area occupied by the vapor column, this is the total area. Okay. So, that can be easily calculated because this is this vapor columns diameter is lambda d by 2 that is what we already said. So, this is given by pi 16 by pi which leads to the critical velocity as 16 q max divided by pi rho v into h l v. Okay. So, this you can imagine how this relationship comes this is the total heat flux and this is the heat flux that is expended in basically vaporizing the liquid to the vapor state. Right. So, this is the total heat flux that you are supplying and this is the heat flux that is actually taken up by the vapor in forming the vapor pool. Right. So, you combine the two relationships one gives u c as this the other gives u c as that the two limiting cases and you get this is the combined relationship for the q max. So, you basically you solve for q max. Okay. Now, q max still has got this lambda d which is hanging over there about which we do not have a clue. So, for obtaining that you do a Rayleigh Taylor instability analysis of a column and you get this as that particular quantity got it. So, you put this back over here you get the total heat flux is given by 0.149 to rho v into h l v multiplied by this particular factor. Okay. 
So, I gave you an idea that how to evaluate the total heat flux. So, how did we do it? Just recap once again. The at the end of the nucleate boiling, you form this vapor columns, right, which we call slug from the surface, right. These are all liquids. This is liquid, this is vapor, this is vapor, this is liquid, vapor, liquid, right. So, these columns of vapors are subjected to instabilities of different kinds because these vapors are moving up, liquid is moving down, right. So, naturally, uh, if you take a cylinder like this, it will start to oscillate, is not that so, right. So, as soon as it starts to do that, it develops that instability. So, standard instability analysis applies over here, right. What we have assumed though is that the thickness of this or the diameter of this columns is 2 times is to half of the uh, half of the wavelength of the most dangerous instability. Then what we did is that because these two streams are moving in opposite directions, right, we calculated what is the critical Helmholtz velocity. And from there what we did was that we calculated that we also calculated in a different way assuming that the vapor velocity is too high, we calculated that what will be the velocity based from a heat transfer perspective, right. That is what we did. And then we calculated the area that is occupied by the vapor bubbles assuming that this is lambda d by 2. So, combining these two expressions we get an expression for q max which has a term called lambda d. So, that lambda t now we are going to close by using a Rayleigh Taylor's instability analysis where we show that this lambda d is given by this particular expression. So, the CHF is given by this which is basically it is basically about 0.15 ok. So, this has got all the relevant parameters over here. So, if the surface tension goes down you know that the uh, critical heat flux will also come down ok and similar and so long and so forth. So, the critical heat flux is actually given by this expression. This is valid over a wide range, very wide range ok of um, very, very wide range of, uh, of conditions ok. So, uh, so, with this we have covered many topics over here ok. We have, we have just said how, how to evaluate the heat flux and the heat transfer coefficient, what is the definition of critical heat flux. We have given you an idea how to calculate it and what is will be the relevant expression without actually solving them. These are the key relationships ok. We have also given you an idea how a bubble actually grows ok. What are the during detachment, what are the forces that are acting on the bubble? How does a bubble actually grow from a heterogeneous surface, heterogeneous nucleation? There are two regimes that we showed over here how surface imperfections can actually lead to uh, to growth and when can a bubble grow. This is the part where it grows, this, this is the part where it is stable, this is the part where it is unstable. We already saw that in the previous ones ok and we also explain the entire boiling curve right which are the curves. So, we say this is the thing, this is the leaden frost point if you recall ok. So, leaden frost point and uh, uh, the catastrophic failures starts to happen when you actually have the heat flux much above uh, the critical heat flux values. We also uh, uh, said what is what is subcooled and saturated boiling ok, subcooled and saturated boiling over here and of course, we also compared what is the difference between evaporation and nuclear boiling. So, with this we end this particular lecture and this particular course. So, we have given you an idea about what boiling is ok, what are the different classes of boiling and some key uh, mathematical relationships that basically uh, isolates boiling from the uh, from evaporation and what are the key features of boiling. Of course, there are a lot of more materials that needs to be uh, covered if this is a full plate on boiling ok. Thank you.